Unmute. There we go. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't make it today, um, but it seems like everyone's having a great time in Thailand. Uh, a bit of introduction to myself. I'm Emad Mostak. Uh, previously, I was CEO, founder of Stability AI, where we had about 300 million downloads of our open source models from stable video, stable audio, but most famously, stable diffusion, the most popular image model in the world. At one point, we were running about 10,000 A100s, which is one of the top 10 supercomputers, and uh, it was quite a ride and interesting. But the original intention of stability was to be decentralized. It was actually originally to be a DAO of DAOs. Um, and earlier this year, I had a big think about that and the future of AI and where we're going. So in this talk today, I'm going to touch on a few elements of that and try to frame it and uh, how we can impact that. Now with my new organization, Shelling, um, we've kind of honed down to, we're moving to a post-labor economy. So let's try and build um, AI money to stack GPUs and increase the intelligence by building open source models and supporting others. So the demand side of DeepIn, but that's a story for another day perhaps. I think that there are three types of AI model, and this is where it becomes very interesting. Uh, the one that's been most famous has been these private models, these chat GPTs and anthropic cords and others. These are like expert systems trying to achieve AGI, kind of do everything. And the knowledge that they have and the data that they have are private. Um, that's interesting, but I think it's that exciting, honestly. Uh, in the middle, we have a different type of knowledge, which is public knowledge that is licensed. So that's entertainment, innovation, licensed data and weights. And I'd put Metan's Llama model under this, uh, you know, open weights, but you don't know what's inside it. On the left-hand side, I think is the most interesting, which is common knowledge. And we recently wrote a piece, how to think about AI, where we're like, models are like graduates. And, uh, you know, they're going to come out as doctors, lawyers, etc. Every industry that's regulated is likely to require open source and open data models. Um, and the stuff that's regulated is the stuff that we need for living, which I think is the most interesting part. There was a very interesting paper by Anthropic um, at the start of the year called Sleeper Agents, where they showed why it's important to know the data that goes in, uh, as in what are the ingredients, how the sausage is made. With just a few thousand words and trillions of words of data going into models, you can make it so it turns provably evil with a single indicator. And you can't tune that out and you can't identify it beforehand. So I think rather than having black boxes, the models that we have to run our lives will be open source, open data. The question is who will build those and who will coordinate those? Because the reality is models are reaching a bit of a plateau because you can't have that much higher on language understanding unless you get to uh, full AGI. So this is closed versus open weight models. But models ultimately are a function of their data. And the data sets are getting better and better. And again, this gap is closing. The output of models as well is getting more and more structured and more and more deterministic. So we designed stable diffusion to be deterministic. You put the same seed in, you get the same output roughly. Now you're getting towards 100% on structured outputs. So these little models, which is a few gigabytes, can transform any incoming data in a reliable deterministic way. When combined with large context windows, that makes a lot of the problems that we've been facing as a kind of community a lot easier. And you should really look into where structured outputs are. So OpenAI's GPT-4 is now pretty much 100% on structured outputs. So you have increasingly intelligent models that are getting more and more structured, more deterministic, um, and they're getting a lot cheaper. So Frontier AI is at 100 times drop in price, um, and that's amazing, and that's a combination of faster compute, but then also algorithmic optimization. But I think what's more interesting is AI equity intelligence. So there's a chart from Andreessen Horowitz of the cheapest LLM with the minimum MMLU score uh, indication of language understanding. Again, above 83 is that graduate level. Above 42 is, you know, it's okay. It's not that smart. Um, and I think this is a log on the left-hand side. So it's getting increasingly cheap. And what does that really mean? Well, for a start, that equi intelligence level is getting above 100 in IQ. So you have 120 IQ on OpenAI's O1 model. Um, and that's quite something. This is why they're looking for data sets. Um, for example, XAI, those of you that are IMO medalists, yeah. they're hiring to train their model to generate synthetic and human-made data. And that's quite something because o one's probably a model that's maybe 30 gigabytes big. And yet it has an IQ of 100. To put that in context, this is average global IQ by country. So where's Thailand on there? You know, you're in the 89 or so. Um, 
the pairing of humans with AIs that have IQs above 100 will be incredibly interesting. And I think this is what we're going to kind of look at as we think about how do we position for an open and decentralized future. This chart, however, isn't because anyone's stupider than others. It's a question of infrastructure. So this is a very interesting chart. It's energy versus wealth. So on the left-hand side, there's energy consumption by capita, and then there's GDP per capita. If you don't have the energy, then it's very difficult to build the institutions and frameworks that you need to have that level of intelligence, to have the schooling, to have the electricity, to have the power. I mean, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore said one of the most biggest advances in there was introducing air conditioning, because it's hard to think when you're hot. Yeah. But this connection between labor productivity and energy productivity is being broken by these models. Because to remind you of kind of that drop in intelligence, that purple line to run Llama 3.23b requires five watts of electricity. The original GPT-3 required a thousand watts of electricity. So that's a massive drop. And this comes at the same time as this chart here, which is the solar PV cost per dollar. It's now less than a dollar per watt of solar PV and a GPT-3 plus to GPT-4 level intelligence only takes five watts of electricity to run. The compute required to create it is in the order of magnitude of 10,000 A100s. And I don't think that will exceed 100,000 A100s. To give you an idea of 100,000 A100s, or actually H100s, shall we say, Elon Musk's supercompute cluster, uh, Colossus, that's the total emissions of BitTensor over the next year. You know, it's about a week of ETF inflows into crypto. So I think that the compute side of things becomes interesting. The energy side of things, equi intelligence, and again, let's bring intelligence of 100 IQ to everyone, so we can lift everyone 200 IQ is interesting. And it's within reach to decentralize this technology, as in have it completely offline. A solar power plant, a solar power panel, sorry, plus a chip gets anyone a GPT-40 level AI in a few years. And that's really interesting to think about because when it comes to you know, cryptography and what we do and blockchains, I think those are amazing for verification, coordination and resilience. And when we think about that left-hand side, open source, open data models for the stuff that we need for living, you know, the stuff I think many of us actually join the industry for, then we need to have verification of inputs and outputs. And now again, we can have deterministic ones. We need coordination to create the data sets and to bring this technology widely, you know, the, the incentivization. I mean, want it to be resilient. We don't want it to be censored. You know, we don't want it to go down when there's a server error, Azure, et cetera. And interestingly, there's a few gigabytes and a few solar panels. We now have the ability to distribute intelligence to the edge with minimal interaction between them. So I think that we're moving from this era of scale. And again, I think 100,000, maybe a million H100s are all you need. Uh, don't quote me on that in a few years. Um, I think that the scaling hypothesis is showing minimal gains versus the data underlying. And the most interesting thing now is the spread of this technology because you're moving from a research artifact that was interesting to stuff that's genuinely useful. AI models that outperform humans on diagnosis and empathy in medicine. AI tutors that are showing massive impacts. 50% of certain industries are now using AI. And looking at this spread and the feedback loops from that, that's how you build better data and better models. So when we think about open and decentralized, I think, you know, you've got not your models, not your mind. <laughs> I'd like to think that uh, that's the equivalent of not your keys, not your crypto. I think open models will run the world. It will be the infrastructure upon which our societies run. And I think, you know, let's make them awesome and let's think about leveraging all this technology and innovation we're thinking about to do that. Because I think open source and decentralized AI has a massive advantage over these centralized ones because you need that spread, you need that reach. And as it goes into everyday life, and we leverage again the systems and infra we've built, we're in prime position to help build the infrastructure of the future to make a difference in people's lives by increasing the intelligence of every person, of our institutions, and ultimately humanity. So thank you for that, and hope to see you all soon. Take care.